The lack of a common cause and the self-interest of many have drained us of much of our energy. A bogus national identity and its commercialization have obscured the true breadth of our culture. So said the late Peter Sculthorpe in describing the background to his Earth Cry of 1986. There is a huge scope of what one could talk about tonight. We're presented with a program perhaps largely unfamiliar to many of us, works by a Dane, an Armenian, an Australian, and a New Zealander. Bizarrely, if we know any of these pieces, it's more likely to be by the Dane or the Armenian than by the Australian or the New Zealander. They are quite a diverse bunch of pieces, but I think what draws them together is a desire to reveal that true breadth of culture that Sculthorpe refers to, and a desire to extend and transform our experience of the concert hall and the Western art music tradition. Whether through transcription, as in the case of Jack Body, or by combining indigenous music and contemporary classical music, as Sculthorpe has done in Earthcry, these composers are exposing us to new types of musical encounters. Where else have you heard a didgeridoo dialogue with an orchestra? More than just composers, though, these people were various combinations of transcribers, arrangers, musicologists, facilitators of cultural exchange. And in most cases, they were no longer simply the composer, in scare quotes. By celebrating world musics, they challenged the idea that the composer is the sole author, the authority, to be worshipped and interpreted painstakingly as if each composition were a last will and testament to be observed to the letter. These composers are not sole authors, but collaborators, participants in a dialogue with tradition and innovation. The composer here has an interpretive role as much as a generative one. This concert is titled Inspired by Exotica. Flicking through an APO brochure or scrolling down the website, one might be intrigued or even a tad confused about what exotica means here. Wikipedia tells me, exotica is a musical genre named after the 1957 Martin Denny album of the same title, popular during the 1950s to mid 1960s, typically with suburban Americans who came of age during World War II. The musical colloquialism exotica means tropical ersatz, the non-native, pseudo-experience of insular Oceania, Southeast Asia, Hawaii, Amazonia, the Andes, and tribal Africa. Denny described the musical style as a combination of the South Pacific and the Orient, what a lot of people imagined the islands to be like. It's pure fantasy, though. While the South Seas form the core region, Exotica reflects the musical impressions of every place from standard travel destinations to the mythical Shangri-Las dreamt of by armchair safarias. Thanks, Wikipedia. Rather than impressionistic, exotic, fantastical collages of oriental effects, the works on tonight's program are very much tied to the qualities and traditions of particular places. Australia, Indonesia, Greece, India, Armenia. The only exception is Carl Nielsen's Aladdin Suite, whose language is a more generalized Orientalism, with titles of movements such as Chinese dance, Hindu dance, and Negro dance. The other three works, though, by my reckoning, seem concerned with getting us close to the thing itself, facilitating a cultural exchange and education. Tonight, I'm going to focus my attention largely on the composers we might know least well, that is, the late Jack Body and the late Peter Sculthorpe. I think with some insight into, into Body's practice in particular and his relationship to the music of other cultures, we can begin to see all the music on the program differently. Rather than neatly summarizing each musical work and telling you what it sounds like, it's my intention to talk around these pieces, draw some links, and perhaps raise some more general points of discussion. Body and Sculthorpe, both recently deceased, are respective icons of their home countries at least within their chosen field of composition, and perhaps within the wider art scene too. Jack Body was only a couple of years ago composer in residence with this very orchestra, presenting a huge extravaganza of a performance in the form of his cabaret evening Songs and Dances of Desire, based on the life of Carmen Rupe. There, 
He mixed Māori and Spanish folk traditions with a Chinese countertenor, drag, stage direction from the late Warwick Broadhead, and a possibly quite be bewildered symphony orchestra. <laughs> Such a striking collage was by mo no means uncommon in Jack's music. As I see it, every piece of Jack's set up a kind of encounter between self and other. Jack's musical practice is a lens through which we can view this whole concert, not inspired by exotica, but inspired by an engagement with aspects of global culture and a desire to expand the concert hall outwards, to create connections across traditions. Let's begin with a little of the work of Jack's you'll hear tonight, the opening of Horos Sera from Melodies for Orchestra. This is based on a Greek fiddle tune and was one of Jack's first big transcriptive works. A few weeks ago, at the NZ Trio's concert at Kew Loft, featuring their latest commission by Chris Cree Brown, I met a friend of Jack's. Actually, there were dozens of friends of Jack's at the concert. Jack knew everybody, and everybody knew Jack. But I mentioned one in particular, a friend, student, and advocate of Jack's, Shen Na Lin, who is currently a professor at a major Chinese university. He mentioned as a sort of offhand comment that his university had just purchased 60 new Steinway grams, 6-0. But perhaps more interestingly, Shen Na Lin is organising a Jack Body conference in December with performers from all over Asia, including our own New Zealand trio and New Zealand string quartet. Such is the significance of Jack in that part of the world that the entire conference is dedicated to his music. John Sathis, another New Zealand composer, described Jack's influence on Asian composers in an interview with the man himself. The extent of this cross-fertilisation was brought home to me recently when you and I were having dinner with Tan Dun. Toasts were being raised to the various fathers and grandfathers of Chinese and New Zealand composition. It was an amazing moment to witness this table of world-famous composers and performers from Asia raise their glasses and toast Jack Body as the uncle of Chinese music. Whenever one travels abroad, the first and usually the only name composers mention is Jack Body. In Asia particularly, he has a kind of legendary status. Through his transcriptive works and tireless energy for organising outlandish musical projects, Jack brought all sorts of people together and encouraged composers to celebrate their musical heritage and voice in individual ways. Here's Jack again. I have, I have found that some contemporary Asian composers have expressed enthusiasm for my transcriptions as suggesting different perspectives on how they might relate to their own traditions. The arranging, the arranging and orchestrating of folk songs is a feature of musical nationalism in many countries, particularly China, and composers are often frustrated by the cliched conventions imposed on them by audience expectations or by the bureaucracy and are looking for alternative approaches. We've heard the word transcription a few times now, so perhaps it's worth explaining what exactly we mean by the term. Composer and lecturer Dougal McKinnon describes it in an article on Jack's practice as the basic tool of ethnomusicologists, and it involves the translation of a field recording of a performance into a notated form. Jack himself described it rather more fancifully in typical fashion. Transcribing is like putting on a mask, 
taking on a disguise, and has now become an important part of my compositional practice. Transcription to me is a kind of travelling, exploring other musics and sensibilities. Modernism, which has its roots in the Renaissance, places great value on individual originality. And this is what our training as composers instills in us. And yet, what does being original mean? When I listen to a lot of the music of today, I hear distinct influences, even in the most original and avant-garde scores. Today's music of fashion, be it Lachenmann, Chelsea, Adez, whoever, became, becomes tomorrow's stylistic cliché. Jack's music foregrounds the fact that aspects of it are borrowed, recycled, reframed. His award-winning CD Pulse includes two discs, one of Jack's transcription-based compositions or arrangements, and the second of the original recorded material from which he transcribed them. Thus he makes completely transparent that one comes from the other, but that the one can never be the other. Here is the second movement of Melodies for Orchestra, which you'll hear tonight. This was a transcription from a solo saluang, a type of flute from West Sumatra. The music is largely monophonic even in this version, but I think the orchestral textures are used cleverly to capture some of the coloristic complexity of the original recording, which we will hear now. skill of the orchestration, the pedanticism of the notation, there are some aspects of the original music that can't be captured. Rather than being a hindrance though, Jack saw this as a positive aspect of his transcriptive method. In an interview with Michael Norris he said, the transcription process exposes the limitations and cultural bias of Western notation and performance practice and the ethnocentricity of our modes of listening. I've found it very instructive working with students over many years, comparing their different notational interpretations of the same music. Considering Jack's output as a creative artist, it might be worth thinking about his transcriptions as a series of encounters between different traditions of music, between different notational systems and performance practices, between a composer and an unfamiliar sound, between the instrument 
the ear, the pen, the page, the instrument, and the air. When you think about it like this, composing is one of the most indirect of creative acts. A composer hears a sound, a combination of sounds, in their mind's ear or in their environment, and puts it on the page as best they can as a kind of blueprint. They've spent hundreds of hours figuring out how to best represent the sounds they want to be produced in notation, and how best to achieve the sounds and the technique of performance. They give this blueprint to the, to the performer, hoping for it to be realized in an inexpressive or an interesting way. The performer translates the notation into sound, and the listener interprets the vibrations. It all seems so impersonal, disconnected, indirect. In a way, the score on its own, unperformed, is the ultimate useless artifact. And yet, when the sound is produced, the sensuality and magic of it is unmistakable. It's a kind of alchemy. Here's Jack again on that al alchemical process of composition. This idea that the creative act took one beyond the rational, beyond the known, the familiar, into a fantastic, sometimes dangerous territory, is something that has reappeared in several of my works over the years. The electronic piece Cryptophones of 1973 was inspired by listening to a shortwave radio on a beach in Greece. Suddenly music and voices from all of Europe, Africa, the Middle East flooded in. The air was filled with a whirlwind of sound. I realized with a shock that, that these sounds were around me constantly, but that without the aid of a radio receiver, I could not hear them. But what if I could? Is this not so different from a schizophrenic condition, being able to hear voices that no one else can hear? How could one communicate one's experience? One would be considered mentally ill, surely, and yet history is full of visionaries who heard secret voices. Joan of Arc, Jesus, what is the difference between a prophet, a shaman, a fool, a madman? To me, Jack Body's great strength and influence was in his attunement to the shortwave radio of culture, his ability to be himself a radio receiver, a prophet even, for the musics of Asia and beyond. Oh.